Welcome back, everybody, to Culture Your Creative. I'm the host, Luke Gledhill. Really grateful and blessed to be here. Um, Culture Your Creative is a platform which ho ho hosts and holds a conversation with incredible people that I'm very fortunate to know in the hope that you can learn, understand, listen to some of the things that they've been through or do so that you can take that on yourself and, and hopefully live a, a better life. I run a brand development agency called Just Up The Road, where I help brands um, really reach their end citizen through their narrative and their storytelling. I also host a think tank called The 21st Club, which brings together people that do good and give back through social, spiritual and environmental initiatives. So today I have, uh, I I'm actually really pleased about today's guest, as I always am, but today is very special. I have Robert Egger, so I'd like to bring Robert in. Hey, Hello, good sir. Good to have you. Thank you for your time, Robert. Um, I just want to actually start out by saying that I'm very grateful for people that say yes to me when I ask them to ha have these conversations. And you were one of the people that were right at the top of the list. Um, you and I very briefly met once after an event from a mutual friend, Aftal, um, who does Good as the New Call. I was blown away and completely mesmerized by everything that you spoke about during that event. And instantly, I just, I, I felt that I needed to connect with you. And we spoke very briefly afterwards. And we've been going back and forth a little bit on email. And we've got a lot of mutual friends. So I'm really excited to get into this and have this conversation with you, Robert. So just for everybody that's listening and watching, can you say who you are? And currently, what you what you're doing, and we can go back into everything afterwards. Yeah, dude, it's it's an honor to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, my name is Robert Egger, um, and I have been for the past thirty some years deeply involved in the idea of how can you use food to liberate people from a wide variety of different kind of conundrums, whether it's hunger, unemployment, bigotry, um, laziness, uh, you know, a sense of social isolation. So anyway, the idea is food for me is is a real powerful tool. The least of it is gas for the body. But you know, right now, you know, it's funny, man. I'm a I'm an older white dude in America, and what I'm trying to do right now is, um, you know, be of service to a younger generation, to be available a hundred percent, and say yes to any conversation by anyone who wants to really mix it up a little bit, or if I can't help them take some proverbial shortcuts based on what I've learned. Uh, I'm just trying to be of service to a younger generation so that they in turn don't necessarily have to put up with some of the roadblocks that I ran into in my 30 years. Yeah, I, I love that, Robert. I really love that. And you know, the reason why is because I think I truly believe that we can all be of service. That's the one that's the, really the main reason why we're here is to be of service and to help others and to hear that you of your standard and everything that you've gone through and what you actually do and lead by that you are there helping the next generation i think that's so important tell tell me a little bit about um what you actually have been currently doing recently well right now i'm working you know my, my great dear longtime friend jose andreas and i started world central kitchen uh, in 2010 based on a lot of the work that i had done at dc central kitchen in which he kind of came in about midway in our 30 year arc uh, and really jumped in with both feet. And he and I both really hit it off very quickly over this idea of the liberating power of food. The idea that typical charity is based on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And we really wanted to flip that around and find a way that we could do that with food. So um, when COVID hit here in, in New Mexico, where I live now, uh, particularly within the tribal communities, it was having a really big impact. So uh, I basically reached out to Jose and said, hey, man, look, I've, I've got an interesting model for us to explore. Now, you may know Jose's been doing a lot of work helping to reopen restaurants across America. Um, but I was interested. I'm always hunting for existing resources that oftentimes are overlooked because we're just so used to seeing them. We don't see them for what they could be versus what they are. And I, I really started looking at the local community college here in Santa Fe and realized they had a culinary program that was on hiatus. All these students had paid uh, their, their tuition 
but they couldn't go to school anymore. And they had a, a culinary team on, you know, on staff. Uh, they had a big ass greenhouse. Um, so I called up the dean and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in partnering to bring the students back in and they can get credit hours while they in turn are processing food and feeding really healthy meals to the broader northern New Mexico community. And man, as they say down south, like a chicken on a June bug, she jumped on it. Uh, and so we, we've been jamming up the meals. And I think probably in the next uh, two weeks or so, we'll probably hit the 50,000 meal mark. Um, wow. so again, it's it's been a it's been a, a very uh, unexpected, but uh, uh, I think very I, I don't want to say joyful, but it has been joyful. I fucking love to serve. Yeah. And I love I love being in it, you know. So it's kind of an unexpected opportunity for me to get kind of back in the kitchen and get my hands dirty again. And even more importantly, and much more to my heart, um, actually going out and feeding people, you know, providing meals to people face to face. I mean, I, I really have always really appreciated that power of food. Yeah, yeah. The power of food is really important, and I want to get into that in more depth with you. But can we um, unpack a little bit? You mentioned World Central Kitchen. You mentioned DC Kitchen. Now, when you and I first met, you also had LA Kitchen. Can you go back a little bit and, and mention about DC Kitchen and then LA Kitchen? Yeah, well, man, you know, I ran nightclubs as a young man, um, and I was intrigued by the power of music uh, to change people. And in effect, the almost Trojan horse that 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 uh, music can be. You know, music can get people to hear ideas that they might want to avoid. If somebody said, for example, let's talk about <clears throat> race or class or or prison or housing, a million other issues. Most people are like, man, I don't want to talk about it. Music, theater, art, dance has that ability to get kind of under people's radar. You know. So anyway, um, joyfully running uh, nightclubs, and I went out. Um, one night to feed people around the streets of Washington, D.C. And this crazy thing happened. You know, A, I noticed that they were they had purchased food and I had worked in an industry um, and a lot of my friends had come out of the, the kind of uh, catering world. And they all lamented. We all lamented how much food was thrown away at the end of the night. And uh, so I'm thinking, well, they're buying food and I work in an industry that throws it away all the time. But more importantly, when we pulled up to serve people, interesting enough, right near the White House, um, here we were serving people who were standing out in the rain. And I kept thinking, man, this is really, you know, I, I get the intent. I understand the history. But still, this is messed up. I mean, I'm up in the warm truck serving somebody. I get to go home and sleep soundly because I did my good deed. But this person is going to be out in the rain all night long. We should be using food to bring people in out of the rain. So I innocently, and I know many people in the audience today and any entrepreneur has had that similar moment where they get that idea and they think, wow, man, once people hear my idea, they're going to immediately understand how cool it could be. So I went around to all the different charities saying, you know, look, man, I run nightclubs. I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer, but I want to help. I got this idea. Uh, and why don't you get the food? And if you get the restaurants, the hotels, the hospitals, the universities, the farmers to donate what they can't sell or they normally throw away. You can feed more people better food for less money. But, but if you offer men and women a chance to come in out of the rain and be part of the solution and you start a cooking school, you can actually shorten the line by the way you serve it. And then the restaurants that gave you food, you can in turn provide them with entry level people who can help them make money. Everybody wins. I was really pretty fucking happy with myself. I thought it was like a really cool thing, right? But dude, and again, I know many people in the audience have been through similar moments where you make your pitch and you just, your crickets. And then instead of that kind of steady applause you expect to hear, it becomes people start, you know, trying to shoot down your idea. And I had to really go through a long kind of uh, uh, kind of frustrating process of people purposely seeming to um, want to find an excuse for why they could not adapt their charity. And again, I went to all the charities in D.C. Um, at the time with this idea and to a one. Everyone said what, what they kept trying to point out the reasons it wouldn't work. So like any kind of entrepreneur or righteous entrepreneur, I was like, well, I mean, look, this isn't what I, I, I run nightclubs, but for heaven's sakes, man, and it isn't that hard and I can't not do it. You know, somebody should do this. I, I mean, just because they won't doesn't mean I should. So I started the DC Central Kitchen in 1988 uh, and opened up kind of officially in the beginning of 1989 with food donated from the very first 
uh, Bush inauguration, George Bush Sr.'s inauguration. And that was an interesting mix of my kind of entrepreneurial streak or my nightclub streak, because again, do media one-on-one. There wasn't a media outlet in the world that could resist the idea of some young dude going to all the inaugural parties and picking up the food left over and taking it to feed, you know, men and women who are out, out on the streets the next day. So it showed me that I could both, I could kind of launch my program, but I could also use the stage of Washington, D.C. to speak to the kind of universal nature of what I was doing. And the model was always based, and it still is, even with the work we do at World Central Kitchen, it's based pretty much on what's already there. You know, again, the model is let's take food our society throws away, people our society undervalues, kitchens that are underutilized, volunteers that truly want to make something happen, men and women who want off the streets and to own their lives again or to move past their past if they were coming out of prison or addiction. That exists everywhere in almost every country. So again, the, the, the steady journey over these many, many years and after millions of meals has been, dude, everything I have is in your town too. All you got to do is use some audacity and a little ingenuity and sprinkle a little badass on top, and you can do this too. Yeah. So that remains my mission. The, I absolutely love that. There were so many thoughts rushing through my mind as you were speaking, Robert, because everything you say makes complete sense in helping to build community and society. Um, Helping to build is, is the key phrase, right? Because we, we look, we've all seen what has been happening through the last two months and what's been really hyper-focused in the last week all across the US and now globally. And it feels as though society and structures are, are built and set up in a way that somebody like yourself should not be doing what you're doing, right? And I mean this, I'm, I, I don't mean this in the wrong way. I mean this in that we need people like you leading the way and, and giving a purpose that a politician isn't necessarily going to do or, or a state or a government isn't necessarily going to do. And you just mentioned that every city has the opportunity to do what you've done, right, and built up. I hope you don't mind me asking because I was quite shocked when I saw this on Roy Choi's Broken Bread uh, docu series that you were in. How how come it didn't work in Los Angeles? Well, you know it's funny, man. You may remember Jamie Oliver, uh, the British chef who came to try and do school food. I was in. I came to try and be a pioneer in the idea of what a senior meals of the future look like. Every single morning in America. 10,000 people turn 70 every day. And that's going to go on for a decade and a half. And I don't know what it looks like globally, but again, no matter where you go, this is a phenomenon never before in the history of the world. And, and we have to really understand that this is going to profoundly affect our economy, our society, particularly if we continue to view elders as expendable. And again, I, I, we're going to talk more about COVID and diet. But if you look at the majority of deaths have been elders in nursing homes because we push older people into these places where we are for all intents and purposes. It's like, go away, go die quietly, please. And so um, but I think what any entrepreneur struggles with is sometimes the very people who should be your allies end up being your most dedicated adversaries, because oftentimes when you go in thinking as Jamie Oliver did and I was compared. Uh, by uh, a senior manager at the Department of Aging in Los Angeles. He looked me in the eye and said, man, you're just like Jamie Oliver. We're going to run you out of town, too. Um, and again, think about this, dude. I came in there saying, I want to serve. This is a community where I was raised. I am coming back here to be a servant to a city that made me who I am. And I want to set up a model that will do literally two-for-one meals. There will be a nonprofit side that will produce thousands of beautiful, healthy meals made out of donated imperfect fruits and vegetables. While we're, while we're producing meals, we'll be training a, a, an intergenerational cohort of young people aging out of foster care and older men and women coming out of incarceration, a very unique model in and of itself. And again, we'll produce thousands of beautiful plant-forward meals. And the idea is, economically, the only way to serve this many elders 
is going to be uh, with meat as a much smaller part of a meal, right? So there was that side. Then there was then I was saying at the same time, if I can get a contract with the Department of Aging to do senior meals, I'll be able to buy food from local farmers at a fair market price. I will employ oftentimes the very um, older men and women coming out of incarceration who, interestingly enough, they couldn't find work nine times out of ten. It wasn't because they had spent 10, 20 years of prison for a felony conviction. It was because they were old. It was ageism that kept them from working. So I was saying, dude, I'll create the jobs. They're the ones who will produce the meals. So in other words, again, two for one meals and any profit I make on this side after I pay good wages, pay fair market weight, uh, prices for the food, I'll just reinvest in the nonprofit. But again, man, what it did is it shook the boat. And I, I think this, again, has been somewhat of a, of a frustrating benchmark on my career. I always want to rock somebody's world. I always want to shake somebody's boat, assuming that anybody in the kind of charitable world or government work in which you're, you're hired, your job is to make someone's life better, that they will have internalized this by any means necessary kind of 1960s battle cry, that whatever it takes, I will do to fulfill my job or my calling to make the world a, a little less hard for someone else. Yet I think what oftentimes happens is they pervert that into, I will keep things the way they are by any means necessary. And so that's what I ran into in Los Angeles. But, but I left a, a serious trail of crumbs behind me. Uh, and like I said, I have helped and I continue to help people all across America. In fact, get this, dude. Just the other day, I had an amazing conversation uh, with a group called the Minnesota Central Kitchen. And as a group of people in uh, Minneapolis, um, pre-George Floyd, um, had been involved in utilizing restaurants to prepare meals. And this, then they called me up, right? And they're like, can we talk to you? It's like, sure. Yeah, man. I say yes. And they're like, they're talking, it's like, we produced 400,000 meals. And I, I just was like, I was just gobsmacked. I mean, it's like four, I mean, dude, I, I prepared a lot of meals in my life, but 400,000, that's a righteous number. So that ripple that has gone out from DC Kitchen, from LA Kitchen, World Kitchen, I mean, there's people I've never met who call me up and just casually mention that they've produced 400,000 meals. And can I maybe talk to them a little bit about how they might do more? So, <laughs> Life is bad, dude, for, you know, an old fuck up like me. <laughs> I think that's a real true testament to who you are and, 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 and your passion, really, with everything that you do, Robert. I, I truly do. Um, let's jump into more about food then, because I know we spoke very briefly before this, and you really want to bring up the awareness of food, and, and I'd like to sort of preempt this by saying the conversation I had with Olympia a couple of weeks ago with regards to how the importance of food is to really give empowerment to people that don't necessarily necessarily have the access to a, a certain class or a, how just really how they're being held back. Um, can, can you talk a bit more about the importance of food with, with that? Well, yeah, you know, again, man, I, I, it's funny because I think people automatically assume that because of the work I've done over my life and kind of the chef friends I roll with, that I'm kind of a, a foodie guy, you know, in the metaphorical term. But I'm not. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. You know, I'm I'm really not that interested in food as something I put in my mouth. Um, I'm interested in food as a revolutionary tool. You know, um, it's funny, man. I, I, you know, as a young man, I was very fascinated by history. And I started to notice this interesting connection between, for example, um, in British history, uh, uh, the first uh, country, England was the first country uh, uh, to abolish the slave trade. And that had a lot to do with the work of a young man named Thomas Clarkston, who would organize the first modern boycott in history, particularly, again, a boycott to exert political will. And it was the sugar boycott. And it was the idea that we are going to um, kind of pinch off the um, economic springs that make slavery work, which was the insidious trade between, um, you know, and again, no, no bad it's history, but England, Africa, and Jamaica. You know, it was guns, slaves, sugar, and rum. And the idea of if we can cut off the sugar trade, we'll cut off the profit. And that began a very interesting arc of history in which 
different people. Mahatma Gandhi used table salt to get the British to the negotiating table. So, uh, Cesar Chavez and Larry Itlong, who led the Filipino migrant farm workers, they joined forces and, find, and started the United Farm Workers, and they used table grapes in Delano to advocate for the rights of migrant farm workers. Um, throughout, and he, if you take it a different step, Dr. King used the dimes it took to ride a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. So that idea of the, the revolutionary power of things that seem so minute, salt, sugar, grapes, dimes, that fascinates me to no end. So for me, at least, food was always a powerful tool that first and foremost, you use at any opportunity you have to liberate people, whether it's from you know, the physical constraints of hunger, whether it's from the health outcomes of bad diet, <clears throat> whether it's unemployment. One of the big models we employed in DC Kitchen and all my businesses have always been side by side. So in other words, the typical model is I'm a volunteer, I'm going to serve somebody who across a table for me, or in my case, the first time I volunteered from up in a truck serving down. My model was, no, fuck that. We're all in, in D.C. and L.A., no matter where, we're shared citizens of the same town. So we have an obligation to work side by side to confront these ills, not in this old, understandable, but archaic construct of charity. And that's what's interesting to me is we have obviously the work and Olympia has done uh, amazing work, uh, as many people have around the country, in confronting the idea of the food desert, you know, and the, and the lack of availability of good food. But at the same time, and it's a it's a tough subject, but this is the moment when I think we in the charitable food side have to acknowledge that for too long, in the kind of vain, glorious pursuit of how much weight did I move last year, and I moved more weight this year, ergo I'm I had impact. That is a tremendously flawed metric because what it did for decades is it kind of seduced people in food banks and pantries into moving junk food, more and more junk food to frankly just pump up the numbers and, and, and create the false impression of impact. And not only was it a false impression of impact, but it was actually incredibly detrimental to those communities that were served, primarily black and brown communities who if you think about this, very, very, again, it is a hard thing to talk about, but it must be acknowledged that the men and women who are susceptible to COVID, when you oftentimes talk about these underlying conditions, they are oftentimes, if you really look at it, related to chronic diet-related illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And we in the sector, and I say we in the kind of you know big, big arc, we have to acknowledge that we played a role in that. Because for decades, we have, for all intents and purposes, with love in our heart, but we have poisoned the poor in the name of feeding the poor. And this should be a moment in our movement in which there is a universal pledge that we will no longer use weight, pounds, as a metric for impact, that we have to focus on nutrition. And again, and, and, and pledge and re-educate our donors and our volunteers and our communities that, you know, we might move less weight than we did the last year, but we will no longer push junk food down onto communities. Um, you know, we will only focus on healthy food. And that's a, that is an essential step. And I hope that charities will do this on their own, but I do hope that more of your listeners and particularly more elected people will start to actually mandate no more junk food in the name of charity. We must have healthy food that will make our citizens healthy so they can be vibrant, active participants in our democracy. Robert, everything you just said is incredible, truly incredible, a food revolution. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been thinking about food a lot recently in the way you've just spoken. And I've, th I've been thinking about the word revolution and what that truly means. And obviously, we know there's a big shift happening right now, and there are going to be a lot of changes. The world is going to be a different place for the better. I truly believe that. What I was thinking as you were saying that is that the powers that be have used, and as you exampled, have used food in a way to suppress communities. Yeah. And they've hidden it 
Now, any other person listening or watching this might not know, and, and it, that's fine because you can start to learn and educate yourself, but they've hidden it in a way that good food, healthy food, organic food, fruit and vegetables aren't deemed and seen to be as um, sexy or, or, or wanted as much as sugary, fast food, those sorts of things. And that's how they've really... That's how I feel that they've really hidden the suppression in that they're advocating for bad food, bad eating, and not advocating good food, good eating. Good food, essentially, is going to fuel a person in a way that through their gut, through their microbiome, into their brain, that will give them the energy, the creativity, allow them to really move forward as a, as a person should be able to. And so when we talk about a food revolution, everything that you've just said, what are instant initial changes you believe can, can take place? Well, you know, man, if some, if some rich person said to me now, it's like, man, Robert, I, I fucking love the way you talk, man. What, what can I find? What would you want to do? You know, it's funny, man. I, like I said, I've pretty much taken a modest vow that my role now as an elder white dude is not to try and stay relevant as much as be supportive, 100% to a younger generation. But I believe that if I could do anything right now, I would love to be involved in creating an intergenerational political alliance based on food. Because again, the only way we are going to dislodge big ag, and, and they have used Citizens United, and for many of your audience, you're probably aware of it, but nonetheless, for those who aren't, Citizens United was a Supreme Court decision that gave corporate America the First Amendment right it's akin to an individual, political rights that nonprofits, I would mind you, do not have. Um, and this idea was what's, what's been going on for ever since then is that corporate America has worked diligently to um, help elect people who will protect their wealth, their profits, and none more arduously than the food business. And again, we've paid a lot of attention to banks and pharma and that kind of stuff, but very few people have paid attention to big food and the role they play. So the only way we're going to be able to take back the food system and switch it from um, private wealth to public health is going to be to elect a generation of people, mayors, governors, congresspeople, senators, presidents, who show up on day one really aware that food is national security. It's, you know, public health is not just some feel-good thing. This is our ability to compete in a global economy. There's a million different smart, intelligent ways in which food is essential for our country. Um, but again, if you look at the world right now, you're seeing generations pitted against one another, and that is purposeful. Um, you know, anytime you study independence movements, and let's let's go back to uh, two men I mentioned earlier, uh, Cesar Chavez, who led Chicano migrant workers, and Larry Itlong, who re who um, led Filipino migrant farm workers. They were separated, and to a certain extent, they never really worked together. And oftentimes, in these kind of environments. Um, people who are down are, are pitted against one another. And you can make a case that in the nonprofit sector, we fight each other for crumbs off the table versus stopping and saying again, as Larry and Cesar did, wait, wait, time out. We're not each other's enemy. We have a joint enemy. Let us join forces and fight that. This is where I think we need to do generationally. And so to me, if you think about the essential need to get young and old together politically, one of the one areas in which you could find lots of common ground is around food, because food is runs the gamut from immigration, wage, um, health and access to food, the way we feed our elders. It's school food. It's prison food. There's a million different ways in which this could be a beautiful organizing tool. Um, in the end, my hope would be that there is an election in America. I mean, at any level in which candidates don't talk about food policy. And not in some simplistic kind of sense of I heart good food, but again, recognizing, for example, that the reason programs like L.A. Kitchen um, run up against the shoals of bureaucracy and oftentimes are smashed on the on the rocks of indifference um, is because policy on how we award contracts is based on an archaic idea of, of whoever has the lowest bid. So think about that. Who's going to feed our school kids? Well, let's decide on based on who's the cheapest. You know, think about how ridiculous that is, because cheap food means for a mayor 
it means that you're going to get processed food, which is going to leave you holding the bag for health care costs down the road. It's going to leave you and your charities holding the bag for low wages and the need to have people who work line up for free food at a pantry, which, again, oftentimes makes them sick, too. Um, and more, more importantly, in this modern economy, exported profit. Because a big multinational food company isn't going to reinvest profit in your town. They're going to send it off to corporate headquarters to satisfy shareholders. That's their gig. So that idea of shifting from low bid to best value, to me, this is a classic example of a policy idea that would really open the door so that programs like LA Kitchen or hundreds of others that say, I'll hire um, vets home from foreign wars. I'll hire young people out of foster care so they don't end up on the street. I'll hire older felons who are coming back so they don't go back to prison and cost us 70 grand a year. I'll buy local food and support local farmers. And most importantly, um, I'll focus on the quality of the food. And hey, if I do make any profit, guess what I'm going to do with it? Plow it right back into community. To me, social enterprise businesses like LA Kitchen, man, we're like economic Buddhism. You know, we're the middle path between dot com business and dot org charity. Um, and so electing a generation of people who understand that food has that kind of power, that it can help rebuild economies, strengthen our society, uh, make it much more just and make people really much more kind of uh, ready, willing and able to get in there and go to work every day. All those good, good capitalist things. But you get my point, you know, I. A hundred percent. I do, Robert. There's two things that I want to follow on from what you just said. I'll go back to the first one in a moment. But as you were talking, I was thinking there's a Dr. Zach Bush. I'm sure you're probably familiar with his work. He has a program called the Farmer's Footprint. And I've heard him talk a lot about food, not in the aspect of revolution, but in the aspect of the next biggest war globally is going to be over food. And he talks about Russia and China leading the way with um with regenerative agriculture and how that the US is is really, really way behind. And, and if things don't change on that level, then there could be serious issues down the line with with being dependent on where the food comes from. Right. So I'd like I'd like your take on that. But the first thing that I was thinking is. Really, you're talking straight politics from what you just said, explained. Do you believe or think that there's a way of leading a charge with a food revolution, as you explained, without being reliant upon politicians? Well, again, I think the ultimate political act is the way you spend your money. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, again, this is what Boycott said. You know, um, again, imagine Dr. King saying, let's fight structural racism in America with the dimes it takes to ride a bus in Montgomery. You know, imagine uh, uh, how what people thought when uh, Mahatma Gandhi revealed after his multi-day walk to the port city of Dundee that he was going up against the British Empire with salt. You know, it always sounds preposterous, yet these have economic impact, you know. But I've always been intrigued because not to challenge these uh, amazing men. And, and I think we talked earlier about how oftentimes when people are truly dangerous, they, they're, they're killed and made into saints. Um, and that's what, so to me, that's what made, to me, kind of open my eyes to Gandhi and King, that when they started, when they were talking about peace, it was one thing. When they started talking about economics and money and showing poor people that they were in charge based on everyday consumption, how quickly their, their boycotts could generate serious pain in a capitalist system. That's when they got killed. So I've been intrigued by that, though, because if you think about it, um, all men talked passionately about nonviolence. But but if you'll follow me, and this is a little bit esoteric, but a boycott actually isn't nonviolent in that, in effect, it's designed to cause, inflict pain, economic pain and coerce behavior. But it worked. But imagine if at that moment they said to their followers, OK, it has now been revealed the way poor people's pennies are spent is power. From now on, instead of holding back our money, we are going to reward behavior and we are going to flip the boycott to the metaphorical boycott. Literally saying, instead of trying to 
enforce behavior, we're going to reward it. And we're going to reward businesses that pay good wages and decrease the need for charity or decrease all of these issues because of the way businesses are run. You know, the charitable model, of which I've been kind of a student of, is still sadly based on this kind of Carnegie Rockefeller model of I'm going to make as much money in my life by any means necessary. And then somewhere near the end, I'll give it back to undo the damage I did making money by any means necessary. The future for a younger generation, just as we're talking about food and the, the, the way, you know, the idea of the boycott or the boycott is this idea of philanthropy needs to be how you spend your money every day, not what you give at the end of the year. And that, to me, is where the food comes in. Now, this is tough because what many people don't want to acknowledge, and you see this oftentimes, sadly, when we talk about issues of health and particularly obesity, because most people view obesity as a personal foible. Oh, you just need to diet. You know, you should exercise more. But I don't think people want to acknowledge is that food has been engineered to be literally crack cocaine. I mean, salt and sugar are drugs. And it is harder. Believe me, brother, I gave up cigarettes probably 30 years ago. And still, to this day, one's too many, a thousand's not enough. I'm a cigarette. I, I, I really have always loved cigarettes, and I just cannot smoke a cigarette. It was harder to give up. I mean, it's harder to give up sugar and salt, probably, than nicotine. You know, this is so deeply, deeply scientifically engineered so that I think we have to understand that we are, to a certain extent, victims of the food system. And it isn't easy to give up. So, you know, there's a lot of, but you can't, you can't badger somebody. I mean, this is why this idea to me of a political discussion around this or an economic discussion, because I think sometimes we make it about right, wrong, good, bad. Um, you know, and I tend to be smart, dumb. This is smart for our country to go forward. This is dumb to have the, the, the way we eat in America. It is bad business for our country a million different ways. And to your point, um, this is global. I mean, we, we're going to have to figure out this new contract, this new kind of social, economic, environmental contract, because we have to feed nine billion people on Earth. Um, and, and, you know, um, what's interesting about our country, and I'll do this very quick, but I'm fascinated by the fact that in 12,000 years of, of agriculture, people dreamed of two things, flight and cheap, plentiful food. And at the end of World War II, we achieved both those things. It's pretty fascinating when you think of it. But for the first time in the history of those 12,000 years at the end of World War II in the United States, an army came home and did not go back to the farm. That had just never, ever happened. I mean, traditionally, rich men declared war, poor, poor boys went off to fight. And then they dutifully went back to their life exactly the way they lived it prior. You know, this really in, in our country severed this kind of agriculture that we had had. Uh, and it's one of the things I find so fascinating about being here in New Mexico now. Because I'm back in a place which probably has the oldest food culture in America. This is where the, the, three, the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash met the occupying Spanish army and their domesticated chicken, pigs, and goats. And it was here that two continents kind of merged clumsily and, and brutally, but it created kind of the first modern American food culture. But it's one of these places that I've been experimenting. We, I talked earlier about what I'm doing here in Santa Fe with the meals during COVID. But what's interesting is every meal we produce is based on an indigenous New Mexican recipe. And this idea of can we, it sounds kind of funny, but what I'm experimenting with is the idea of can we fight hunger with tradition? Can we fight hunger with community? Can we relook at this agriculture and the relationship between generations and use that as just a, a, a living, breathing example? of what kind of it could look like. But dude, at the end of the day, it is political. I mean, we're gonna have to really, really pry loose the steely grip of big ag on America. Uh, and, and again, find a new relationship between the essential need to produce large amounts of food, but one that also respects the opportunity that exists in every community to own a little bit more of its food sovereignty. Yeah, I, I think big agriculture is a really, really open discussion that could go deep very quickly. Um, what I was thinking, what you were saying before, is I feel I'm feeling what you're saying. And what I'm feeling is that we need advocates, right? We, meet, we need more advocates. We need more people 
that will be spreading or to, or just holding these conversations, giving this message to people that don't know that. That that's what I kept thinking as you were talking. And you're a very strong advocate for everything you've just mentioned. We, it's almost as if we just need a, an army of people that are, that are going to be shouting this from the rooftops, right? Well, you know what, what, what's the funniest thing in life, dude, is, uh, you know, when I was a young man, I'm running DC Kitchen, right? And uh, my board chair or our board chair calls up and says, hey, I got this young chef I want you to meet. I'm like, sure, man. Again, I'm, I'm a yes man. But at the same time, um, visiting chefs were a big part of our model because chefs were employers. But like everybody, myself included, you have we all have baked in bigotries and 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 sad stereotypes that kind of color our idea of the world. And for many people, people who are in prison or homeless or addicts, we have this image, right? So the idea of having chefs come in to volunteer was a lot about helping chefs see men and women in our job training program as really desirable employees, right? Well, in walks Jose Andreas, a young man. You know, really right, you know, just in, from New York City with this new idea for tapas restaurants, you know, small plate. And Jose was just one of many chefs that I've worked as in my career, but he stuck with it. He was one of these people who just never left, was always there. Um, and I've watched his career, um, you know, for a while I chuckle, you know, because it's like Jose's at it again. But I'm just I'm, I'm in awe of what he's been able to do. And I think people at first looked at him and thought, oh, he's a, 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 a very clever chef. Look at what he produces. Look at all these kind of interesting, innovative things. And he was a disruptor in the culinary world. Well, for the past 10 years or so, Jose and those of us who work at World Central Kitchen and all the volunteers, we've been disruptors in the kind of disaster relief in which food is oftentimes flown in. And oftentimes by this, again, charitable act, what it actually does it's, it looks good, it sounds good, it feels good, but actually it tends to tamp down the local economy's ability to rebirth itself because no one's buying local food. We just looked at it and said, why on earth would we do that? Let's go into a community and support the local farmers. Let's hire local chefs. Let's reorganize or reopen restaurants. So that idea, once again, of, of trying to challenge the orthodoxy of, of a structure, whether it was the culinary world, the charitable world, so right now you have the world is really in awe of Jose in the World Central Kitchen, which has produced like 50 million meals uh, in the past few years. And, you know, again, he's on the cover of time. But I think in Washington, D.C. and in many places, they still want to see him as, oh, you know, again, St. Jose, the feeder of the poor. I don't think many people in Washington realize that Jose, just as he disrupted the, the kind of culinary world, just as he, as he has and continues to disrupt the charitable world, He's coming for their world next. I think Jose is, and you know, yesterday was the two year passing of Anthony Bourdain. Uh, and, you know, Anthony was a man who also really, in such beautiful, literate, poignant ways, exposed people to the true beauty and power of food and the universal nature we all share. Jose is, I think, his heir in many respects. You know, um, they were friends. And I think Jose has that potential to be a global leader on this idea of how do we view food. And in fact, uh, one of the more interesting things to watch is Jose is advocating now for like a U.S. Department of Food and almost let's take apart the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, which, by the way, has one of the next to the Department of Defense has one of the biggest budgets. But it's also such a huge Gordian knot. Um, I think this idea of let's. As, as much as it's time to dismantle police departments, I know that's controversial, the same thing needs to be said for the Department of Agriculture. You know, it's time to take it apart and put it back together in a more purposeful and more American, if I may be so bold as to suggest, way. I mean, we're a generation, of, we're, we're, you know, if anything, I, I don't want to go start beating a nationalist drum, but we have a history of innovation and dynamism, people saying, it's my generation's time. You know, I respect your generation's work, but it's our time. These are our rules. And I think uh, the, the quicker a younger generation can get in and start to exert some influence over these unhealthy hands that have too tight a grip on our food system, the better. Yeah, there was two things that kept sticking in my mind, Robert. 
we've never been more global than we are right now. Okay. But now there is more of a need to stay focused on local and community. And that, that's really what I'm taking from what you've been saying. How, I know you're a big advocate for community and, and, and I, I am also, I think that's so important. People, we're all humans. We, we all feel like we should all be feeling like we're part of a, of a, of a community. And I love the fact that there was something I read on your Instagram where you said that you add a big dose of audacity. So how do you think that people can really be focused on, on thinking about local in their own area and about their community and, and bringing food in, in a way of everything that you've been saying? Well, you know, it's funny, man. Food, again, I, I've always been kind of astounded by this because when I was a young man, food was, you know, wasn't that big a deal. I mean, I don't think people really thought about it. It was really interesting enough, almost the, the beginning of the cable television uh, uh, and in and, and the 1990s and the food channel that kind of birthed the celebrity chef at the level it is now. Um, but again, you know, you mentioned something earlier that I think is really imperative because, again, in my opinion, we've we focused on food for so long as stylized gas for the body. You know, literally, it's fetishized. I mean, the whole, and I had no disrespect, but I've never been a big fan of the kind of food porn Instagram, look at what I ate tonight thing. My thing is, um, you know, if you really think about this idea of uh, uh, food and we've been feeding people for so long without recognizing that there's this deeper hunger, uh, and you touched on it. You know, when most people are laying there on their deathbed, you know, they're thinking, I, I, I hope I made a difference in the world. I, I hope my life mattered. You know, when people come home, there's a sense of, I, I feel like my life is empty. I didn't contribute anything. To me, this is what the food movement should be focused on. It's less on, Sarah, you know, this idea of, of the, 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 the glory of food and, or is the potential of it. I mean, that's a little bit clumsy, but the idea of recognizing is, look at my generation. I mentioned earlier, every single morning, 10,000 people turn 70. One of the things I have to imagine, and I always kind of laugh, and I say that, you know, it's a wonder you can't put your head out the window and hear a sigh every morning as 10,000 people look in the mirror and wonder, how could I have been part of a generation that was alive and, and witnessed Dr. King, John Lennon, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, you know, Bar Betty Friedkin, Miles Davis, Prince, you know, um, and how could I have gotten so lost and tricked into thinking if I had bought more junk, I'd be happy? And if you think about them, and then you mirror that on the other end of, of 100 million people under 35 in our country who've been raised doing service, you know, who um, have expressed so clearly their lack of interest in choosing between, you know, this idea of making money and, and doing good deeds, this idea of uh, integrity and a paycheck. They wanted both. That's an army of people on both sides that are basically looking anxiously looking for a place to go where they can make their life and the world, their life have meaning and the world a better place. You know, I think we all saw President Obama when he was inaugurated kind of touch that energy. You know, you could feel it in America on inauguration day. I was there and it was one of the most powerful moments of my life uh, because it felt like we could accomplish anything. And in fact, I heard from friends around the world who were like, man, God damn you Americans. Just when we think we, we can put you all in the ash bin of history, you inspire us again, you know? Um, th that energy is never gone. It's still there, and you're seeing it on the streets today. Um, so that idea of, of, of a revolution of opportunity, it's there. It's always been there. It's just waiting, and I think this is my point with my movement, whether it's the charitable side that thinks I fed the poor, I fought hunger. It's like, no, you did a good thing, and somebody got a, a meal today. And that's always going to be right and just. But if you make somebody dependent upon you for food on a daily basis, that's in, that's bondage. You know, so this idea of I wish our movement recognized and more people recognize that, um, you know, again, there's a deeper hunger in America. And if we tap into that sense of that hunger to be part of something bigger and that pursuit of a more just world, there is nothing we can't accomplish. Uh, and I think that's what is uh, so striking about Jose. I think he is similarly striking that chord, this interesting mix between kind of a, a, a chef and a humanitarian. Uh, 
So anyway, again, I'm, I'm inspired by him. I'm inspired by so many things right now, but I do, I do so wish um, that we weren't so focused on feeding the poor as much as we were on organizing all Americans to exercise their first, their, you know, their, their, their kind of social contract to get out there and vote and get the right people in. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, um, you're an incredible person. I truly love your energy and your passion and thought process for everything. I really do. Before we wrap this up, there's a couple of quick questions I want to ask you. I could talk for days with you about this because you really are inspiring. Is You've mentioned Jose as, as an inspiration to you. Is there anybody else or any other brand or company or nonprofit out there that you think is, is really leading the way in, in, in food or, or a revolution of food or, or just inspiring you? Well, you know, man, it's funny because I was asked to write uh, for an online uh, magazine called Blue Avocado. And I'm like, yeah, dudes, you know, I've written, I, I, you know, I've loved the long trail. People don't want to hear my, you know, they, they know what I think. But I'll tell you what, I've got an army of young people who I really think are fucking badass and really need age. If, if you want to give me a platform, let me, let me expose people who, who you know, your, your followers to people who I dig. So every month I have a column now called Against the Current. And the idea is to constantly find young people of color primarily, because I think the nonprofit sector has been run pretty much exclusively by white people and, and many times white men. And it's and it's really important, I think, as a leader um, for me to step back and say, I've had my time. You know, I've been to the well. I've drunk heavily from the fountain. It's another generation's time. So I'm trying to use this opportunity to expose as many people I can to a lot of ferocious young leaders. So. Again, if you're interested in who I dig, um, go to Blue Avocado and you'll see my column, uh, you know, against the current. And it's just interview. You know, I just like asking people, you know, man, if you could get the ear of a presidential candidate, what would you tell them? Or how much money do you really need to bust out? You know, or tell me about, um, uh, you know, what a younger person I should know about or an older ally. You know, I'm just trying to throw a little bit of a curveball into the usual interviews and give young people, and again, particularly young people of color, a real chance to to roar. I love that. I love that. And I'm definitely going to tell as many people as I can to go and check your column out because I think that that is something that people need to see 100%. Um, last thing before we wrap this up, you've given so much advice and inspiration through this conversation already, Robert. And I know you're a big advocate for people to go out and vote, which is important. Is there another piece of advice that you could give to anybody listening or watching that they could take, go away and introduce into their life that could help for the better with everything? Yeah, and I'll tell you, man, it's something that I, I, it's been, you know, two or three of my benchmarks. You know, one is if you chase money, you run forever. If you chase results, money comes to you. And that's always been my business mantra. And it's worked historically, you know, uh, you know, Again, talk is cheap, as Mama Egger used to say. It's where it's deeds that count. Um, you know, so again, that idea. But but most importantly, you know, if you're a leader and no one's following you, man, you're just taking a walk. Leaders don't create followers; they create other leaders. You know, so if you're a if you're a CEO of any business, recognize your best strength is not your brand; it's your people. Invest in your people. Give them a say. Show them your respect. Pay them a good wage. Give them the day off to vote. You know, uh, and, and be the kind of person you dreamed you wanted to be when you were a 15 year old kid looking in the mirror saying, man, when I get old, fuck that old shit. I'm going to change the world. Be that same kid you dream, you know, be the adult you dreamed you were going to be when you were 14. Robert, you're an incredible person. You've got my vote every time, mate. Um, I, I kind of joke a little bit about this on every conversation, but I'd like to have a an advisory board for the world, and for sure, I'd love to have you on it. As long as you're serving tequila, I'll be there. <laughs> Salute, my friend. Thank you for your time, Robert. I really appreciate you. Thank you, brother. It's been a pleasure, man. Be well. You too. Take care. Bye. Wow. Robert is or inspiring he's an incredible human being. The work that he's done, the work that he continues to do is... I mean, truly inspiring. 
Uh, I can't say enough on that. Um, I hope that you look into more about Robert and what he does. And I'll be back again soon. Thank you.